Thanks very much. I'm delighted to be here. And thank you, uh, Jeffrey, both for your kind words, but more importantly, uh, more importantly for, let me just get, make sure you can hear me adequately, uh, uh, also for organizing this wonderful conference. Uh, it's really very exciting and very impressive. Um, and um, I look forward to talking to more of you uh, over the course of the conference. Um, I'm uh, hoping I won't be uh, too redundant about what uh, David just told you, and I've tried to separate out uh, some ideas. Um, and I'm also going to tell you what you already know. Uh, I think everybody here uh, already knows what took uh, the medical community, or is taking the medical community a while to uh, appreciate, uh, is that diet is important in health. Uh, <laughs> It's sort of, it's, it's obvious to everybody here, uh, and I think that it's, it's becoming more obvious to the medical community. Um, and so we'll talk about things stepping back very far, and my hope is, is that uh, where the medical community is getting there sort of backwards, uh, meaning that we're, we finally understand that the microbiome is important, and we're beginning to understand that the diet influences the microbiome so much, uh, so that diet will be important. And I think it's, it's, it's important studies being done uh, by uh, people like uh, David and Barbara Olensky, who's here as well from UMass, that really drives the medical community to understand and appreciate what's going on uh, and become a central part of therapy. Um, so to start, uh, to step back, uh, which of the following is a correct answer? An antibacterial mouthwash increased blood pressure in hypertensive men. The microbiome influences obesity. A distinct microbiome has been associated with bipolar disease. An FMT, fecal mi uh, microbial transplantation, with individuals with end-stage liver disease and hepatic encephalopathy improved mental functioning. Now, the microbiome has become, has sort of exploded and been important with everything. And so if you look at this list of things that seem in some ways fascinating, in some ways a little bit wild, you'd say, well, which one of these is possibly true, because these days, the microbiome seems to be responsible for everything in life. <laughs> and the answer here, as you may have guessed, is that they're all correct. Um, that uh, there's a study done out of Australia, whoops, um, out of Australia suggesting that um, hypertensive men who were taking an antibacterial mouthwash, they looked very, very detailed. This isn't a dramatic effect on, on uh, blood pressure but just a, uh, a few points. Um, but just the fact that it did that at all is pretty remarkable. When we think about what are the things that affect our health, what are the uh, elements that influence things, whether it's blood pressure, whether it's uh, GI disease, it's amazing. So whether it's uh, obesity, bipolar disease, uh, other things, uh, we're beginning to appreciate that there is this intense interaction with the uh, gut microbiome as well as uh, skin microbiome and everywhere that we carry with us that's part of our uh, daily uh, health and uh, illness. So what I'm going to talk about a little bit here is what is the microbiome, what is normal, what is abnormal, how is the microbiome associated with health and disease, how can, how can we manipulate the microbiome for health and to combat disease, and what's the role of diet. So it's a lot to cover in a short period of time. I hope I don't use too much medical terminology that is uh, confusing, uh, and so please, if I say something that doesn't make sense, uh, raise your hand and I'll try to clarify. As you've heard, there's a tremendous number of bacteria in the gut. Um, it is um, probably one trillion per gram was thought of before. It's probably about 100 or 200 uh, billion per gram. So when you go to the health food store and you pick up a probiotic that is 50 billion, it sounds like a whopping number. Uh, but when it comes down to it, it's not that much. They're not always alive. They have to get, get through the acid barrier into a, uh, the bile, which can be, uh, have different effects on the microbiome, and then get into a hostile environment uh, in the uh, colon. As David mentioned, uh, there we have uh, somewhere between 20 and 40,000 genes as humans. Uh, the gut microbiome has two to four million genes. Uh, the vast majority of which are not culturable, meaning we can't grow them, and so we've developed techniques over the last 15 years to be able to identify who's there. We're just beginning to get to the next level, so meaning we've been do doing many studies of association, meaning 
if you've got Crohn's, what are the bacteria that tend to be there? What are the ones that tend not to be there? We're just beginning to get to the next stage, which is what's the function? There's so many overlapping genes between the bacteria, it may be more what's the genetic components there than what the uh, individual uh, membership is. These ideas go way back uh, even before this, but Metchnikoff, uh, Russian who then moved to Paris, um, and he uh, attributed the longevity of people in Bulgaria to their consuming of large quantities of fermented milk identified as uh, Bacillus bulgaricus, and then later renamed uh, Lactobacillus acidophilus. And he actually won the Nobel Prize for work on neutrophils, a particular part of the uh, immune function way back in 1908, um, and felt that there is something about auto-intoxication is the term uh, that he developed uh, with certain types of bacteria uh, that we may have with us. Uh, and this then matured uh, to uh, the uh, influence of others who started looking at it, like Jeff Gordon out at the University of Washington, and promoted something called the uh, Human Microbiome Project. So the NIH sponsored this, uh, a great effort where they took 300 healthy people to try to define what is healthy. Uh, they looked at multiple body sites, 15 different body sites in males, 18 in females, multiple visits, and got lots of clinical data to say, let's at least try to have a background agreement on what is healthy or what is, let's say, normal. That's a very complicated thing to do because when we say, well, what, what really is healthy? What should we be eating? And what's the microbiome we're aiming for? It's much more complex. And so let's step back a little bit further and say, what did we used to eat? what was healthy and what was what might be normal. So if we look here uh, and we say, how much fiber should we take in? Well, a typical American diet takes in probably about 5 to 15 grams of fiber. The American Heart Association says it should be at least 35 grams. But here we have a, I think, a lowland or midland ape who, uh, whose diet perhaps approximates what we used to eat 10,000, 12,000 years ago before we started to be farmers. And they took in probably about 100 to 150 grams of fiber a day. That's tough to do, um, and that requires a lot of grasses and, and bark and possibly grains and other things that we might not be taking in today. And what's very interesting is there's a phenomenon called colonic salvage. So a lot of these complex carbohydrates are not absorbed in the small bowel. They go into the colon. And they're the primary source of nutrition for some of the so-called good bacteria, somewhat lactobacillus and somewhat bifido. Um, and those bacteria change it into something called uh, short-chain fatty acids. So short-chain fatty acids, particularly butyrate, is the primary uh, fuel for the cells that line the colon. And in people with ulcerative colitis, it's been suggested to be deficient. There are other things that may be going on with the microbial environment that blocks the uptake of butyrate. So it may be very important, but just to mention here is that in our diets, we may take in 3 to 7 percent of our, calo our calories through this change of complex carbohydrates to short-chain fatty acids to then being taken up. In what it used to be was it used to be uh, the suggested in paleo nutrition, not the sort of popular diet, but what did we really eat? Uh, 10, 12,000 years ago, and they suggest we took in about 40 to 60 percent of our calories through our colon, which is pretty remarkable because we don't think of the colon as a nutritional organ. Uh, we think of it as sort of a reservoir. It, it absorbs fluid. It does some other things, um, but it's not primarily a nutritional organ, and it probably used to be, and we've lost that appreciation in part because we've changed our diet, um, and it's it perhaps somewhat contradictory because certainly some things that the specific carbohydrate diet might say is not uh, advocated um, were things that were probably part of our fundamental diet. Um, and that would then have a profound influence on the microbiome so that when you're taking, when you're having this tremendous amount of complex carbohydrates going into the colon, that's the preferred fuel for the, some of those so-called good bacteria, as I mentioned and they're going to grow. They have a lot more than of these resources 
uh, to uh, expand and say, this is a nice and hospitable environment for me, so I'm going to expand my population. And so a lot of the, the type of microbiome that we used to have would have been radically different. So when we say what is normal, it's probably not the normal that we evolved with uh, over the uh, past millennia, but we have a very different uh, diet now. And when uh, Jeff Gordon and others have looked at a whole bunch of species uh, around the world and a, a lot of different individuals, this is a complicated chart. Um, but when you, you can see that, that the, the green, uh, you can see is the herbivores, so uh, animals uh, and individuals who are taking in, uh, not taking in meat, uh, there is a, a greater diversity of bacteria that are required, probably because the task of digesting so many different types of things is much tougher. Um, the carnivores um, here had a much more restricted diversity, and as David mentioned, there is an importance about diversity. It's probably a duplication of, of genomes and other things that give a broader set of, of uh, enzymes and other factors that are important for health. And then omnivores are sort of a little bit in between. So there's this issue of diversity and that diet impacts diversity significantly. And then when people have gone into looking more at humans and looking at humans in different environments, there's a radically different microbiome in life in a rural village in Burkina Faso uh, compared to a, a European or American uh, diet today. So again, it, it pushes the question of what is normal and what are we really pushing for when we say we want to have a healthy microbiome? How do we define that? And then what influences the microbiome? And uh, this is going to be a little bit redundant in terms of some of the things we'll talk about, but every stage at life influences what's your microbiome. So what is normal at a certain age may not be normal later. We'll talk about birth mode, breastfeeding, your first nutrition profoundly affects your, your uh, microbiome. Uh, there are complex carbohydrates in breast milk, uh, which are probably important in giving your microbiome its sort of foundation and its initial uh, start. Diet, exercise affects it radically, so there's actually a company uh, that is, I think it's starting, I've heard about it, where they're trying to get uh, microbiome, meaning stool samples, from highly trained athletes. Uh, saying that they've developed a very healthy microbiome. Can you take that, use that microbiome, and then give it to somebody else who isn't necessarily exercising? <laughs> and is that a lot easier than running a marathon or at least even running every day? Um, as much as the microbiome may affect the disease, disease also affects the microbiome. So your immune system is there in part to create some sort of working relationship with the microbiome. And when you have more inflammation, part of that inflammation is directed towards trying to uh, ward off uh, threatening uh, bacteria. Uh, aging influences it, certainly uh, drugs, not only um, uh, antibiotics, but others as well, and even where you live. So in studies that we've done looking at the microbiome, sometimes the biggest thing we find is are they, were the samples taken from Canada or were they taken from Boston? And how does that influence uh, what goes on? Uh, we did a study looking at twins, so genetics. How does genetics influence uh, your microbiome? Uh, we went out to Twinsburg, Ohio. None of these people have IBD. Um, these two gentlemen went to high school with the women, and, and these two guys in the background are her uh, sons. It actually was, it was remarkable. This is Twinsburg, Ohio, where every year they have a, a, uh, a conference for twins. Um, I'm not a twin. Uh, we, we, uh, there are about a thousand twin pairs who are really into being twins, so they're all sort of dressed alike. They're not all identical, but some are, are uh, and so we went out there to collect st uh, stool samples. Um, it's my idea of a good time. Um, my wife and family did not come along. Um, I was a little disappointed. Um, but the idea was to say, um, are, is the, are stool samples from identical twins different from non-identical twins? <clears throat> and um, the difficulty in part is that most of the twins are raised together. Ideally, you'd do this study in twins who were separated at birth and raised apart. But still, uh, we could show that um, unrelated twins were much less uh, close together than related twins. 
and um, identical twins were a little bit uh, closer uh, in what their microbiome content was like to uh, non-identical twins, suggesting that there is a genetic component, but probably that genetic component is much less than what was appreciated before. But also it's difficult because the intestinal microbiome changes throughout your life, when you're a, a uh, before you're a born to when you're born and what you're eating and then when you're weaned um, and uh, growing up with antibiotic treatment or illness or malnutrition, and there's even some work done to suggest that kids with kwashiorkor are more significant malnutrition, really severe malnutrition, protein, energy malnutrition, have a distinct microbiome that may be partly causative um, in terms of how it processes in the same way the other side of it, the ob obesity may be that there's also a microbiome that, that uh, sort of processes your nutrition in a certain way to predispose you towards nutrition. And then as we age, things change as well. And just to reinforce some of these things, it's also immunity, antibiotics, lifestyle, smoking certainly influences the microbiome, and even depression, whether depression influences the microbiome or the microbiome influ influences the depression is not clear. And then there are different subfractions of nutrition which are clearly important. To try to understand this, um, two um, intrepid researchers in Boston, Eric Alm and, and um, I think it's Michael David, Eric Alm was who I did the twin study did, did a remarkable thing. They wanted to understand influences on the microbiome. So what they did is they created a sort of an app for themselves where they would monitor about 80 different factors every day, how much they slept, what they ate, how much exercise they got, what else they did. And they collected stool samples every day for a year. This is whether they were traveling in South America or wherever they were. They did this to try to say what influences the microbiome. And one of the things that was really important is just to show the variation in an individual over time. Because it used to be felt in the medical community that your microbiome is really very, very stable. And in many ways it can be. So much so that they can, people have suggested it almost could be like a fingerprint, like a forensic thing, and people have looked at even things like your uh, keyboard on your computer and saying that there's a distinct microbiome that you could use in a court of law. People haven't done this as far as I'm aware of, but to say this is the individual who's been using this. Often when you use an antibiotic, it does snap back uh, to the same uh, place you were before, but not always. And here you can see these are, the, these are the two different individuals who collected their stool and then analyzed it um, more or less daily over the course of a year. And you can see here that there were certain significant changes. So when uh, there was a uh, travel and changing to different foods, that radically changed the microbiome. And then uh, one of them had an infection. Um, and that caused a major disturbance. And uh, then it, it came back eventually to something that was uh, closer to what it was. So what this reinforces is um, that everyone does have a distinct microbiome, but that changes such as all the different things that we've been talking about here, but other things, whether it's something like travel, whether it's infection, whether it's other things, influence it. Things tend to go back to where they were before, but not precisely. So when we start looking then at things like uh, diet, and particularly diet over time, I'll go through this quickly because David spoke about this before. This is this very interesting study done, I think, in the, at Stanford, perhaps Sonnenberg's, um, who looked at these microbiota accessible uh, carbohydrates, or MACs, and saw that over time, particularly from one mouse to another, that different species were driven to low levels and were inefficiently transferred to the next generation, meaning that over time, as a species, we may be altering our microbiome in a very significant way, so that even when we try to change something, some of the bacteria we would like to have there aren't necessarily there to increase. Um, and then we get to the role, not just in health, but what's the role of the microbiome in disease. And so 
Certainly we know that there are things like Clostridia difficile, C. difficile, a bacteria that often can sort of overtake the colon and cause a colitis, particularly in the setting of antibiotics. So there's something about good bacteria that influence and prevent uh, C. difficile, but people with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's can be predisposed to the development of C. difficile even if they haven't gotten antibiotics. But there's something about a dysbiosis in Crohn's and ulcerative colitis and IBS in other metabolic diseases such as obesity and diabetes, particularly diabetes type 1. There's increasing uh, data suggests that there may be an important association there. And then there are other uh, autoimmune diseases which are felt not typically to be part of the microbiome uh, related diseases, but increasingly there are certain signatures that seem to be present that may be critical, and people are starting to look at ways of changing it, and certainly autism and depression as well may fit into that spectrum as well. So when we talk more specifically about inflammatory bowel disease, we typically look at this kind of uh, diagram where there's some genetic susceptibility, uh, there's some immune response or, dis or dysregulation of the immune system, the microbiome, and environmental triggers. And <clears throat> this goes for whether it's IBD or really any autoimmune disease, we look at this in this kind of uh, uh, diagram to say that these things, those people who have enough inter, uh, interlocking uh, influences will get this. But I think it's somewhat misleading. It's misleading in part because the way we got here is, well, we could do genetics, so we did these big genetic studies, and the genetic influence is there, but very, very mild, at least for inflammatory bowel, bowel disease. So then the next thing that we have accessible as tools is we can look at the immune system. So we then looked at that, and so we have this as one of these circles. We're just beginning to look at the microbiome and the environment, meaning diet and other things. We really have the least good tools to look at and they're the toughest studies to do. So it makes it look like all of these are really equivalent. Uh, but I think it's somewhat misleading, and that took me a long time to do, to get that <laughs> slide to do that. Uh, but in any event, the idea is the environment is probably really uh, the critical component. Having said that, once, it, it, once the disease starts, it sometimes gets in its own loop that's independent of the environment. So early onset disease may be different from later onset disease, and it's another factor to understand in terms of whether diet or change in the microbiome may be effective, and sometimes you've got to break a different vicious cycle to be able to allow other things to be effective. And one of the things that we can clearly tell, as David allu alluded to as well, is that places where we did not used to see inflammatory bowel disease, we now see in growing numbers. Um, so there's been a globalization of inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, it used to be really seen in North America and Western Europe, um, and now uh, it's really everywhere. And this is, is uh, not even a good map representing this. Uh, David had one up there more. I've done a lot of work in India. Looking at the rise of IBD, uh, we don't understand the factors. It's not that everyone's going to a Western diet. It may be more processed foods and other things because it's still a traditional Indian diet. Um, I was uh, not too long ago in Saudi Arabia. They've seen a skyrocketing of Crohn's there. It's interesting. Usually ulcerative colitis comes into a population about 40 years before Crohn's does. Um, and uh, now, uh, but they're, they're both uh, increasing significantly throughout the world. When we look at some of the environmental causes, uh, we know that smoking uh, is worse for Crohn's. Smoking actually, oddly enough, is protective against the development of ulcerative colitis, and it's even more complicated because if you smoke and you quit smoking, then your risk goes up higher than if you had never smoked at all. Um, Nonsteroidals, meaning things like Advil, Motrin, other things can be um, detrimental and cause flares for ulcerative colitis and Crohn's. Appendectomy is protective against the development of ulcerative colitis. Breastfeeding seems to be protective against the subsequent development of Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, but particularly Crohn's. And then the microbiome and di diet are known, but really to try to dissect that and understand that is really just the process that we're beginning to look at. These other things are probable or much more speculative, but how it fits in, even things like air pollution, we've done one study suggesting that air pollution uh, may have an influence. How that does it and what it does, we don't really uh, understand, uh, but there are all these factors in the environment which we're just beginning to appreciate. 
So when we look at the intestinal microbiome and inflammatory bowel disease, I think that we can understand that there's been a radical change in the microbiome in the last century. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of these things. Some people have suggested even the use of refrigerators. Now, I'm not suggesting you should throw away your refrigerator, um, but that it um, assures the survival of certain types of uh, bacteria which are more the, that survive better in cold environments. And there's one theory about Crohn's, Crohn's disease that's interesting. I don't think it's quite held up, but it's, I think it's called chronotropic, but those that are, are, are uh, Crohn meaning colder, uh, appreciated in the, uh, that refrigerators have really selected out the type of bacteria we're getting. We're not getting all the probiotics we used to get in our food, uh, but it's more selected down. Uh, antibiotics are certainly a risk for development of Crohn's and likely ulcerative colitis as well. And we've shifted. There are many changes that we've shown uh, that have been shifted. There's less bifida bacteria, more bacteroides as one example, and that's important because this idea of the hygiene hypothesis, we're not getting exposed to the right uh, pathogens so that our immune system isn't getting primed. I think that what's happened is that our gut flora used to be something that stimulated our own immunity that was protective because it had beneficial effects on our immune system as a positive uh, influence, something called the innate immune system. Uh, and now I think that it's actually a factor in, in innate immune impairment. Um, and that now uh, that explains perhaps what's happened. Now, when we look at some of the more specific components of, uh, of fiber, uh, of, of diet, uh, it's fascinating. There was a study done looking at dietary records back in about 1815 in London and saying, what did people take in about 200 years ago? So people took in about 15 pounds per capita per year of refined sugar. So who, any guesses on how much refined sugar the average American takes in in the year 2000? So it went from 15 pounds per capita 200 years ago. What's that, 50? 150, 200, so it's probably about 150. So now many people in the room here, that the, you're, you're, you're helping bring down the average, uh, and other people are, are pushing it way up. But it's pretty much amazing. It's probably a tenfold increase in refined sugar intake over the last uh, 200 years. Now, we don't know if that in itself uh, has a role. It may have some impact, certainly. It's hard not to feel all of that's not absorbed in the small bowel, and so that has some impact on the intestinal uh, bacteria. We have reduced fiber intake, so we're not taking as much of the complex carbohydrates. And it's not just secondary. Some people said, well, that's just because of zinc deficiency. So people with Crohn's are zinc deficient. They're not tasting the sugar, so they're taking in more. So meaning that it's, there's an increased refined sugar otherwise, and then some studies, not all, have suggested that people with IBD take in even more sugar. That's not consistent, but people said initially it's due to zinc deficiency, and then that's felt not to be the case. And there's also a decrease in complex carbohydrates that also have an important uh, effect on shaping the uh, intestinal bacteria. Interesting, the nurses' health study, so this is a study done um, out of uh, Harvard School of Public Health where they follow about 120,000 nurses across the United States and they fill out questionnaires on periodic intervals including a food frequency questionnaire. <clears throat> One of the studies looking at fiber and inflammatory bowel disease, they found a number of cases who subsequently developed IBD. So it's not people who had Crohn's and are being followed, but it's somebody who didn't have Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, and is, they have data then before they develop it, and they're looking back saying, before they developed inflammatory bowel disease, what was their diet like? And here, in Crohn's disease, there was a risk reduction associated with fruit fiber. Fiber from cereals, whole grains, or, or legumes didn't modify the risk, meaning making it better or worse, and this association was not seen in ulcerative colitis. So an increasing, an in interesting study. When we look at fats and IBD, some of the changes are less dramatic, but still significant. There's been a 25% increase in fats in the U.S. diet in the first half of the 20th century, and ulcerative colitis came into the United States probably around uh, first mentioned in textbook about 1875. Uh, Crohn's was first mentioned in uh, 1910, 1912, but probably really became more of a significant disease described by Crohn's about 1932. Um, so when things were, now that's also when refrigerators started being used widely, and 
Uh, you could blame it on lots of things, but even if we're just looking at fats at this point, um, increase, um, and uh, particularly then looking at uh, subtypes of, of fats, so probably what's called the um, N6s are more detrimental to than the N3s, and maybe that ratio is critically important. Um, and it's interesting, though, because it's also in one study done prospectively, looking at people in remission and who flared. Um, people who are taking particularly processed meats were at the highest risk of flares. Regular meat also had a significant risk of flares. We did a similar study where we got about 450 people in remission just on mesalamine with ulcerative colitis to see who flared, and meat did not uh, come out as being a significant factor uh, in flares. Um, but there are other types of fats which are critically important um, in maintaining health, even though certainly with Crohn's disease there's been a very good study, two good studies, of giving high doses of, of omega-3s to maintain remission, and both studies were negative. Now, they weren't controlled for N6s, there were other issues with them, but um, there are other studies much smaller that suggest there may be a uh, benefit. Um, so when we think about in, inflammatory bowel disease as one paradigm, what's the acquisition of flora? Well, it's the mode of delivery has not been consistently shown, but C-section is associated with more of early onset Crohn's disease. So we acquire our flora through the birth canal uh, very early on, and so C-section, you're not getting exposed to some of those um, bacteria, and that was the hypothesis. It's not consistent in every study, but perhaps shows something. Breastfeeding, as I mentioned, um, can uh, suggest a, a significant reduction in uh, the risk of developing Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Um, and it may even be in part, uh, on the breast nipple, there's certain, uh, there has been shown more bifidobacteria, and that might be one way of also getting more uh, or enhancing that uptake there. And then in other ways, in terms of gastrointestinal infections, when they look at twin studies, the one that had the infection uh, was more likely to go on to uh, develop um, uh, inflammatory bowel disease. And antibiotic use, they're taking away, they're discounting not antibiotic use in the year or two before, but they're saying two to five years before because somebody might be, be prescribed an antibiotic thinking that the Crohn's or ulcerative colitis is actually an infection, um, and that is also a risk. Again, other ways that the microbiome has been shifted. So then how do we manipulate the microbiome? So how do we use this information, not just to say there's an association, but how do we improve things? There's antibiotics, um, which uh, affect it, but it's fairly blunt instruments. There's probiotics. We'll go through that a little bit. There's prebiotics, so the complex carbohydrates that can affect the microbiome. Um, and there's diet, and then there's also fecal microbial uh, transplantation, which we'll talk about a little bit. Um, I'm going to run through some of this because we're running a little late. I want to also just mention very briefly in passing that there's lots of other things in the intestine other than the intestinal bacteria. So we think of it as viruses in there as well, and also fungi. Um, and those, are, those may be very important as well. There's also the issue of parasites, which there was an interesting hypothesis for a long time of saying that we got rid of our parasites, we evolved with them, they act as a natural break on our immune system. So the idea is what's, let's give you back some, uh, some um, parasites. And there was a, some very good data to support this. We were very excited about this. We were part of the studies. Um, a pilot study looked like this was going to be very effective with 43% having a good clinical response in ulcerative colitis compared to 16% on placebo. There were two large studies done then, one in Europe, one in the United States, um, and these unfortunately both uh, uh, were not effective. Um, and then there was going to be a study of ulcerative colitis, but my understanding is that's been dropped as well. So other components, I don't want to ignore those altogether, but just to mention in passing, uh, that there may be a role for other things other than the, um, the bacteria. But we know that there is a distinct dysbiosis. We know that you can take a knockout mouse, meaning they're missing a particular gene, so they're more susceptible to the development of inflammatory bowel disease, and uh, they can get, uh, they can take, you can take the bacteria from the uh, knockout mouse who has developed colitis, you can give it to a healthy type, and they can then go on to develop uh, colitis.
So the question first is, can you use antibiotics? There's good uh, evidence that we use antibiotics for Crohn's, particularly for Crohn's colitis, and this is, we typically use Cipro and Flagyl. Um, uh, they're not so effective or really not effective uh, except for some anecdotal experience in ulcerative colitis. Um, and so, again, we're messing in a big way with them. They're, they're blunt instruments, and we want to get a more refined way. So we started looking at other, other people have looked at other probiotics. Uh, e. coli 1917, or called Nisla 1917, found by Professor Nisla in the German trenches of World War I. It was a platoon that got pretty much devastated and wiped out uh, by an infection in the trenches, but one soldier did extremely well and didn't get sick. And so this professor said, well, you've got something that must be uh, good. And he identified, I'm not sure how he determined that this was the particular one, this is a long time ago, but it's become used in Germany routinely. Um, it's, being, it's in the United States now as well. And this was a large study that was done, published in Lancet, a very good journal, suggesting it may be as effective as mesalamine. It was used at lower doses of mesalamine that we traditionally use. So this was one study, a lot of skepticism, but suggesting maybe uh, a benefit. Another study looking at prevention of uh, recurrence with lactobacillus GG, uh, something that discovered at, uh, I think, Tufts here in Boston. Uh, and this was a randomized controlled trial. It looks big, but not huge. Um, and those that got the probiotic, about 31% uh, relapsed versus 17 on placebo. So not suggesting that it's detrimental but showing it didn't help. Um, there wasn't a statistical difference. If anything, it made things worse, but I wouldn't say it made things worse, but it certainly didn't uh, help. Um, not to go through too many, but I'd say the best one that was done in ulcerative colitis is this one done by Shanahan in Ireland. They took about 150 people in remission, and then they randomized to two different probiotics, which they screened about 1,500 different strains. And the primary endpoint was getting people off of steroids, which they all came off of, and who was still in remission. And uh, between the bifido, the lactobacillus, and placebo, 50% in each group were in remission. There was no difference in mean time to remission or anything like that. So it was uh, not uh, supportive, again, how much needs to be used, uh, and what's the right strain, what are we trying to uh, improve is, is tough. So probiotics and IBD, mixed results at best, Overall data at this point don't suggest a clinical effectiveness for a particular probiotic for induction or maintenance of remission in Crohn's. Post-operative recurrence, no benefit. There's a little bit of data for something called VSL number three for pouchitis, which is a different subgroup. We can talk about that later. I'm not, I'll go through very quickly, because David touched on this very well, about other elements in food that we think of, whether it's low particles, um, whether it's emulsifiers, which really have uh, an important effect, um, or carrageenan, but I think this was touched on otherwise. So I want to talk now about uh, FMT, so fecal microbial uh, transplantation. Um, this was the first one that we did at the Brigham, uh, so we were very excited about this. Uh, this is just before lunch. <laughs> um, but to add in a little bit more, this was uh, started with the uh, consumption of fresh, warm camel feces was recommended by Bedouins for bacterial dysentery. So we looked into getting fresh, warm camel feces. Um, it's tough in Boston, uh, so uh, instead we just went for uh, healthy donors. Um, and we wanted to use the name intestinal microbial restoration, thinking that might be better, but that hasn't really caught on. So the concept is that these are so-called human probiotics, meaning they're massive doses. When we talk about the, the doses we use, we, they sound like they're big numbers, but this is, then can we do a more radical transformation of uh, the uh, gut microbiome with a healthy bacteria? Uh, first mentioned in fourth century China, uh, as I mentioned, World War II, and then it's for C. difficile, we know that there's something, as I mentioned, about the healthy microbiome that can um, prevent the development of C. difficile. So people started using fecal enemas for C. difficile back in, in uh, 1958 with significant improvement. It then sort of fell by the wayside and then was resurrected more recently. Um, a gentleman, Barodi, from Australia reported six cases where he was treated with uh, uh, he took six people, they took, uh, I think, 
six or seven days of fecal enemas from a loved one, and he reported that they came back to him and said, I'm cured. They might have said, I'm cured, I don't need to see you anymore. Um, but uh, he then, curiously, when I spoke to him, said, well, he, he got ridicule for this, so he didn't keep on doing it, but he's treated hundreds of people with uh, transplantations for IBS. Now he's back in it with IBD as well, uh, but this sort of fell by the wayside for a little bit until others took this up. Now, part of this is kind of random and kind of a little bit unscientific, meaning we don't know what the defect is, we don't know what the problem is, and we're saying, we hope, in the same way it works for C. difficile, we just take a bunch of stool from somebody, we throw it in there, we don't know what the problem is with that particular microbiome, but let's hope that this just does it. So uh, it's, it's a little too random. We know that for C. difficile, it can be dramatically effective, so these are for uh, a one-time infusion of donor feces, 81%, uh, uh, and then overall 91% uh, prevention of recurrence. The problem with C. difficile, as many of you might know personally, is you get treated with antibiotics, then you can have recurrence in 10, 15, or even 30% of the time. Um, and so this was uh, much more effective. This was in the New England Journal, but this was a one-time uh, infusion. And this was something that's probably a little bit more ubiquitous that is needed to correct uh, C. difficile and prevent recurrence. This is now being looked at uh, at a whole bunch of, host of applications, not just in GI, but chronic fatigue, obesity, um, liver disease, multiple sclerosis, atherosclerosis, diabetes, and allergy, just to mention a few. Now, I should just caution, uh, I know this didn't quite make it on, but this is a slide that we often put on for any number of new technologies or new approaches. So this says here the peak of uh, inflated expectations. Uh, we then go down to the trough of disillusionment, uh, the slope of enlightenment, and then the plateau of productivity, meaning it sounds like such a good idea, and it's such a wishful thing, meaning I feel terrible. Can't you just do something that's a quick fix and get me feeling better? And so we all would love for this to work. Uh, it's my, you know, it's in terms of side effects compared to all the things we do. Um, but I think we're now sort of somewhere recovering from some of the trough of disillusionment when we realize, yes, this works, but it's, it's in a small population in IBD, it's much more complicated, and how do we figure this out so we can get through the slope of enlightenment and get on to something that really works? And when we compare C. difficile, which has gotten a lot of press, to IBD, C. diff can be a single infusion, rapid symptom reversal, works in the majority of patients, Success is no symptoms and no stool uh, colonized for C. difficile. For IBD, the early studies were single infusions, uh, and now we have capsules because clearly you need to do multiple. It's not just a one-time deal to get the microbiome to change. As much as I went through all these things that changes the microbiome, you need to really produce a significant effort because there still is something that keeps the microbiome pretty steady. As much as we want to be able to manipulate it, for the health of the individual, you don't want a microbiome that changes wildly. You want it still constrained in certain sort of parameters because you need it for health. So there is a stability there and a lot of movement within that stability, but so in order to change the microbiome, uh, it still takes a lot of work and we're just beginning to understand that. Symptom reversal may be slower, it may be transient. It will work in a subset, but we haven't figured out who the subset is or who the donor subset is. So there's something called super donors of people who, the people who receive their stool or their mixture with other people seem to work much better. And the symptom is a little bit more complicated than uh, what we look at in C. diff as well. So how do you get the best engraftment is also a complicated issue. How do you get it so the microbiome that you're trying to put in there to take stays there and persists? And we're not sure about how to do that. So the uncertainties are identifying a donor, defining the populations of individuals as well as bacteria. Some people are making a formulaic gut flora. A group in Canada have called their formula repopulate. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, how do we uh, prepare the recipient also? It's not just a matter of just taking in whatever you've got there, but do you need to have antibiotics? Do you need to take a bowel prep for? What do you do to reduce the amount of bacteria there? And what's the in interval you need to do this? Is it um, we now have capsules that we give people once a week. Is it daily? Is it weekly? Is it monthly? Do you need booster doses? All these things. When we look at the data, this is a little bit more of a complicated slide. 
Some people certainly can achieve a remission, some people it's durable, some people not, and this is 32% versus placebo, uh, which is usually around 15%. Um, it is, and the studies are very variable, they're uh, small, um, and um, it's not nearly as good as FMT for C. difficile. It's not ready for prime time, further studies are needed. And there's a question of safety. Most likely it's safe, but there have been some problems. What are the active ingredients? What's the ideal recipient? Who's the right donor? And who's, what's the right disease? All these things are issues. And when we look at how much can we alter the microbiome, we certainly can show. So if we look at the uh, red versus the green further there, that's before. The red are the non-responders, the green are the responders. So the ones that responded changed their microbiome more than the others, but there's significant overlap uh, as well. Looking at both week four, week eight, this is a study we did with Beth Israel looking at uh, people with Crohn's disease. The safety overall in IBD of FMT looks pretty good. Uh, sometimes there can be transient effects, meaning you get the, the, your first transplant, some vomiting, diarrhea in, in a low percentage of people. Uh, that tends to settle down. We've seen a number of people who did, did it themselves at home who had some problems because typically the donor stool is screened quite intensively even if you know the donor and their, their uh, friends or family and, and healthy. There can be some things that they harbor that aren't problems for you. In the studies that have been done, it was about 12% had a more significant adverse event um, for these are people who had IBD and C. diff and were receiving FMT for the C. diff. About 12% had uh, AEs. It may be between 10 and 15%, maybe a little bit more, had IBD worsening as a response to that, but it also could have been that uh, they worsened in part because of the C. difficile. I'm not going to go into the FODMAP so much, just to mention the specific carbohydrate diet in a little bit more detail because of, of why we're here today. Uh, is there certainly have been some very good studies uh, suggesting that there is a benefit of the SCD um, in uh, Crohn's disease. Um, in the uh, modified study uh, done by Barbara, who's with us today, um, there was really also a quite of a dramatic uh, response in terms of looking at the baseline. HBI is a Harvey Bradshaw index, which is a clinical index of how someone is doing. And then the follow-up score had uh, dropped quite dramatically uh, to something that is uh, asymptomatic or just slightly symptomatic. We tried to just do also a similar study to what David done. We went on to online patient community to the chronology is the name of uh, an online group for Crohn's. Uh, we sent out hundreds of uh, requests for surveys. We got 122 back, so there may have been some bias in terms of who responded, but we found that uh, that a durable, that the people who are on the SCD for greater than a year, about 46%, and about 26% for three years or more, and about two thirds reported a uh, benefit. David had shown this before in terms of microbial changes with the SCD. Uh, the dysbiosis is different in, in individuals, and there's, with the SCD, there was a minor increase in diversity some changes towards a more uh, normal microbiome. It's been mentioned that James Lewis and others are doing this study of this uh, specific carbohydrate diet or something that is close to it. And just to mention, I don't think people here would necessarily be candidates because you're probably already on it, but I think what's important here is that uh, studies be done, whether it's this, whether it's what Barbara's doing, it's whether what David's doing or what we're doing or other people doing, that for, the, for this to become more broadly accepted in the medical community and to be more broadly accepted in the general community, doing studies are really, really important. Data drives what we do, and better data drives it uh, in a more productive way. This study, very briefly, is it's a randomized controlled trial, mild to moderate Crohn's disease, comparing specific carbohydrate diet. I know some people here have some questions about how this is being done, but I think it's an attempt <clears throat> compared to the Mediterranean style diet. What they're doing here is they're taking about 194 people looking at this um, uh, Crohn's disease activity index, calprotectin, the marker of inflammation that you can measure directly in the stool, and um, CRP, and looking to see uh, how this works. They're being given their uh, initial food for the first six weeks. Um, I know that's not the sort of uh, 
gradual um, introduction of various things. Uh, so it's a lot of food that they're being given. They can only do it for six weeks because of limitations of funding, but then the people are, are encouraged with instruction to do it on their own for another six weeks and see um, if there is a response. So I think that we're beginning to understand what's normal, but we're really in the very, very early days of appreciating the microbiome. We understand that there are lots of influences of the microbiome, uh, and also that the disease influences the microbiome, uh, but diet is a critical determinant of what goes on. These rough association studies, meaning we'll take 50 or 100 or 200 or even more patients with a particular disease and see what's up or down, gives us a minor understanding of function, but we're just beginning to understand what are they doing there that's detrimental or beneficial, and how do we harness that in a better way. So how to change it? We're just on the edge of a new era. And I hope that we're more broadly on the edge of a new era in terms of how we care for uh, people. I'd say that in the same way that we uh, sometimes uh, look at medications too much exclusively in the medical community, we want to create a, a broader appreciation of all the different modalities of what are needed to bring someone to health. So it's not, you know, diet, and particularly the SCD, takes a lot of effort and dedication, as you all probably know. And it involves really not just diet change, but it involves lifestyle change, it involves behavior change. And so working within that parameter to figure out how do you help somebody really get healthy, it involves a much broader set of things. It involves exercise, it involves issues around smoking, it involves diet, it involves other things about lifestyle change and stress and how to manage stress and how do you put all that together. So it's one more piece of the puzzle that hopefully is critical and can get people towards a, uh, a healthier uh, life and a better quality of life. Uh, so as Josh Billing said, a, a writer uh, two centuries ago, I finally come to the conclusion that a good, reliable set of bowels is worth more to a man than any quantity of brains. <laughs> so, thank you very much. <laughs>